Maybe a little more. Sorry. Um, that's all right. I got it. Um, <clears throat> and then, of course, there's the base. And I'm going to talk about making the base for those things, too. But, yeah, so when they're done, they're still about four, four by eight inches. They're about a half an inch thick. And they're on a base. So, um, but like I said, the, I mean, I'm just lucky. I've got a very good clay company here where I live in Columbus, Ohio. Um, and they saw the need for this when the pandemic started. So I can't tell you, but I will say that their brand worked well for me and there was not a lot of cracking. And I wish I could share the stuff with you guys. I will say that again, I guess we'll start with this. The clay that I use that's not air dry clay is called a white sculpture clay. For you clay people out there, it fires to Kono 6 and the sculpture clay is a good mix between throwing clay and building clay because it has a medium amount of drog in it, which makes it smooth enough so the students go, don't go all crazy on me when they're trying to smooth everything out because they want everything to be perfectly smooth all the time. And it has enough body in it that it doesn't really crack or explode. So it's, it's called a medium body clay. So that gives it strength. So usually pottery clay has less body because they want it to be thin and smooth and you know feel good on the hands and when you're drinking and eating out of it. When you're using sculpture, you use a heavy body clay because you want it to be solid and not fall apart or be outside or whatever. And this is a medium body 06 clay. I apparently know way too much about clay. But the air dry stuff, I got nothing. They made this air dry stuff. It was great. It came in the same size block. So it was perfect for me. <clears throat> All right. It's like another language for me. I don't know anything about it. My students were saying something to me the other day. And they were like, wow, you know a lot about art. I'm like, I've been teaching for 27 years and I've forgotten everything else. So I guess when you teach something all the time, you forget everything <laughs> you're supposed to be doing. So uh, let's see. Thank you. <laughs> Bless oh, you. Bless you. All right, so 7-Eleven, do you want me to get going? Yeah, can you okay. just um, fill your, make it a little bigger? Can I make it a little bigger? bigger? And, yeah. Hold on. I gotta remember how to do that. So that's, Baker. No. No. Uh -uh. Does it not show the whole screen? It's showing um, the gray background, but it's small. Really? It, yeah. Like I see a lot of your graffiti background <laughs> behind the screen. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, no, this is just how the website looks. Oh, okay. Yeah, I think the rest of it will get bigger. This is how the website looks. I guess I can try to make this small. Can I exit that? Hold on. If you have a Mac, you can do Command Plus. I do not have a Mac. I have a PC at home. Or Control. Control, control plus. plus. Try it. That yes. Yes. Okay. Yes. Um, <clears throat> so Thank here you me. go. No problem. Uh, so I'll start real quick. So with the uh, welcome, everyone, or wait a minute, Steph, do you want to do this? Or you, <laughs> I guess you do this. This is your club. Then I'll tell her about me. Sorry. Okay. Um, pardon my voice. I've not been well this week. So I'm going to make it quick. Welcome, everybody, to our Thursday night, our teachers, our club. Um, and welcome to Matt, who is, I think this is your second or third time facilitating for us. Um, you are the amazing wizard of Ohio and sharing your uh, amazing creativity with us. And you're also doing this exact workshop at the conference. So I don't know how many of you guys are attending the conference. I will be there. If you're going to be there, please stop. If you see me, stop me, say hello. Um, I'm going to try to connect with people who, who I know from online, which has been an amazing amazing opportunity. So um, enjoy this session. It is being recorded. As always, all recordings are posted in YouTube on the Nikata UFT channel. And with that, I will hand it over to Matt. <clears throat> all right. Thanks. 
And yeah, I think this is my like third one because most of my stuff is computer graphics, but I thought this was good because I am going to do it at NAEA and it's for virtual or in-person students. So I think this works well for both, even though it is a 3D thing. And I don't think there's a lot of 3D things that translate well to both um, teaching, teaching both. So uh, yeah, Matt Young, I'm from Columbus, Ohio. I teach high school art um, in a suburb southeast it's pickerington uh anyway point of story this is my 27th year of teaching and i am not a wizard but i am the president of the ohio art education association i have done a lot of work for the art of education and scholastic art and writing and some other stuff like that i just chalk it all up to i've been teaching for a really long time so there you go. Uh, if you guys want to take this down, the Central Art blog, feel free. This is our blog and it has all the resources on it. So if you want to see what classes we teach, you can. Um, I'm going to be using a few of these things. Um, and when I'm done, I know that Steph always puts these things up on the YouTube channel, but we also have our own YouTube channel. Uh, so some of the videos I'm going to be showing are up here. Um, but you can also feel free to scroll through any of the other ones that I have on the page. There is also a teacher resources page, which is free for you guys to use if you want to see any of the other presentations I or the guys that I teach with have done before. So not so much a shameless plug, but it is a resource that I feel that we all <laughs> need to share with each other. And so everything here is for you guys. Uh, but today we are going to be doing something that my students really love to do, which is not foundations in computer graphics. Way to go, mouse. Let's try this again. Uh, graffiti sculptures. So uh, um, this is kind of a typical one. I'm going to show a few of them here, uh, what they look like. And like we were talking about in the chat, they're about four inches tall by eight inches. Some are a little bigger because the kids will make them bigger. Some will make them smaller. They all have a little base. I'm going to talk about this little 3D printing thing here kind of at the end. Um, but this is kind of a typical of what you get for a high school student. This is done in my foundations and 3D art class. I teach six weeks of sculpture, six weeks of ceramics, and six weeks of jewelry. So this is their intro to sculpture. Uh, again, background on my students, we do not have elementary art full time, so my students get about 14 days of art while they're at the elementary school year. Then while they're at the middle school, they get about nine weeks of art at the middle school. It isn't until the junior high where they can take 12 weeks of art. <laughs> Uh, at the junior high, which is for us seventh and eighth grade. And then it isn't until high school when they have semesters of art, just to kind of give you a little background of it. Uh, my classes are 45 minutes long. Um, and like I said, these are all intro kids. So these are kids that are take 3D art for the first time. And this is the first project that we do um, because I found that writing words was not very intimidating to students. So. Um, they have a lot of creativity in here. As you can see, this is London, you know, and you've got the, the, the Big Ben, the London Eye, obviously the flag actually cut out the slab and the shape, you know, you get the, they just, they go through so many things. Rainy here, it's got the raindrops with the puddle, with the splash that's happened on the ground. There are so many things that I have seen through the years. And it's really great because every single year, there's somebody that comes up with something new and I have it. It's just great to see different stuff every time I'm doing this. So uh, like Steph said, I'm gonna show this at NAEA. <clears throat> so I thought I'd just kind of take you guys through the process of what I do with the kids. And I would um, kind of show you what I show the students. Then I'll kind of give you some tips and tricks along the way, show you actual like videos of me doing the project. Um, and then like kind of talk about the assessments and field some questions. So we'll start with this. So at the beginning of class, remember this is the first time I've got these guys. So they are literally sitting there kind of wondering what's going on. So I found this like great video on YouTube. Um, and the thing that's neat about it, oh, whoops put the mute sorry is I think this is a great way to capture the kids like interest because they wonder what the heck I'm doing 
showing this video like in front of the class. I have a huge screen in my room. I'm lucky enough to have that. The kids already think I'm like crazy. So I'm showing them this video like within the first week or so with this music kind of pumping out of the speakers in my room. And it just, it really kind of grasps their attention onto what we're doing. And the great, this, this video just goes through a whole warehouse of graffiti. And so I've got the, got this play again, I'm lucky enough to have a big screen and speakers in my room. So I'm just kind of giving the kids a talk about how graffiti is an art form. It isn't like what we used to think of it as like, you know, bad or somebody doing something wrong. I talk about the Miami, um, I'm drawing a blank on what they are, but they're they're down in Florida where they have all the industrial buildings that are just for graffiti as an art form. We discuss about the lettering. We talk about the different things that can go on besides letters, such as gentlemen on a couch. And, <laughs> but there's just a whole bunch of other things that go. You're muted, Matt. I don't know what happened. Sorry, we good? Yep. All right, there we go. I want to stop myself and see if I can move on. Hold on a second. There we go. All right. So uh, I've got their attention now. They're watching. And I talk about how it was in Germany and I saw these things because Europe has tons of graffiti. I saw these pieces sticking out of the wall. And I got this idea that graffiti could kind of be a sculpture. So then I talk about some of the different styles, how graffiti can be like completely like a beautiful piece of artwork, how it can be political, such as Banksy. We have a long discussion about <clears throat> how artists can become famous, uh, such as Shepard Ferry and the Obama posters, um, and how like take something you're passionate with, start to develop your style again. I'm hoping to kind of capture their interest with these things. A lot of these students, at least mine, have seen like Obey on t-shirts in the mall. And I explain, you know, like this is how they started off. They started off with graffiti on the walls and on the sidewalks. So then I talk a little bit about finding inspiration and what inspires me. Um, so uh, a lot of my class revolves around planning. Um, since it's 3D class, there's not a lot of sketching. There is some, but not a lot. And we are one-to-one -one with Chromebooks. So there is a lot of stuff about putting ideas, almost like Pinterest, into slides in your Chromebook in the classroom <clears throat> to kind of start to develop a portfolio of how you'd like to build your sculpture. So I kind of give this speech of, I really like this. This is called wild style graffiti. So I really like this wild style. I explain I like the curves and how the letters are kind of, you know, out and tribal. I just kind of tell them about my thought process. It's got this little art guy. It reminds me of Mike Splaskowski from <clears throat> Monsters, Inc., another favorite movie. Again, trying to make the connections, but it's got a pencil and a spray paint can. I'm an art teacher. I'm an artist. Then this is Retina. He's a LA-based graffiti artist that did a whole bunch of studies with different languages. Um, so he came up with his own wording. This really doesn't mean anything, but he finds beauty in the writing. And so again, this is kind of like what I talk about with the beauty in the writings. You know, the, the students think it's cool that I have retina like tattooed across my arm too. So <laughs> again, I teach kind of in a urban suburban area we are 50 percent minority this makes a huge connection kind of with my students so they've got this loud music playing i'm talking to them about my process because a lot of these students have never had this before like try to think of your art and what artists think about so <clears throat> then we go on to what they actually need to do so i tell them they've got to choose a word any word and it doesn't even have to be a word I say you're going to have to make five characters. So five characters, and I say a character could be a letter. It could be a hashtag. It could be an exclamation point. It could be numbers. So if they wanted to do something that was like 2023, like exclamation point, or then, you know, I try to start throwing things out. Like what could go on it besides, you know, an exclamation point and the kids will yell at like graduation cap or diploma. I'm like, exactly. 
So we started kind of talking about what has meaning to them and what they would like to do with like a word, letters. And five is the minimum that they have to make. I'll be honest with you, I've had some students try to do some crazy words. The longer the word gets past 10, the like it's impossible. Now I'm not gonna stop them, but that's when you talk to the students about, well, maybe like do something on one side and something on the other, do something on the top, do something on the bottom. Don't stifle their creativity. But I will say five is the minimum, but 10, you're really pushing your sculptures, just FYI. Um, so they have to have at least five different characters. They also have this, we start talking about art elements, color, texture, design, theme, mood, because it can't just say, for example, we're the Pickerington Tigers. It can't just say like tigers, all right? What are you gonna be with a tiger? Is it purple and white? Do you play basketball? Do you play football? Does it have a field? So we start talking about some of these things and how do you just make it? They're like, well, what if it's just gonna be me? What if it's just gonna be my name, you know, Sarah? It's okay, Sarah, what do you like? You know, you know, Sarah likes flowers, Sarah likes coffee, you know, and Sarah likes hanging out with her friends. So we kind of have this discussion again about what things mean to you and why it's important. It's important to make art, not because I'm telling you to make art. It's important to make art because you want to make art. I, I, this is kind of like my hook to the kids. Um, and then it, I, we talk about it having a clear focal point or center of interest. I'm trying to introduce these art principles to them. And here's the art principles. I won't bore you with that. Hopefully we're all our teachers in the art teaching club. <clears throat> so then I tell them to pull out the Chromebooks and start looking stuff up to get inspiration. So start looking at places and find things that inspir inspire them. And we, this is the theme. So, you know, if you're trying, you know, to do something with clouds, you want something over here. If you're trying to do something with like maybe a video game or something like fast cars or something like that, you may want the lettering over here. If you want it to look more professional, maybe you want straight up block. <clears throat> so we talk about the whole theme and mood and stuff like that. Uh, just FYI, this whole PowerPoint and discussion with the students lasts like a whole 45 minute period just to kind of get them into it. Um, but it goes really, really fast after you show the video and you kind of hook them in with the whole, <clears throat> they get into it while the whole time they're doing it. Let's we'll switch over here real quick. The whole time they're doing it, they have this sheet in front of them. It reminds them of everything that I'm talking about. It has little examples of graffiti on it and it kind of talks a little bit about the process, it has some of the design elements and it has this square. It actually has four squares on a separate sheet of paper. In FYI, this is an eight and a half by 11 piece of paper. So it allows by a four by eight inch block, which will come in handy in a minute. <clears throat> so they're sitting there and I tell them to kind of keep staring at the block and, you know, staring, like look at the block, envision your word, look at the block, envision your word, because it's gonna be important that you have a four by eight inch block for them to start drawing in. Like I said, that'll, Makes sense here in a minute as I keep going. <clears throat> so then I show them what the sculptures are gonna look like. And this is a good example. And so we have a talk about why this is a good example. T-I-G-E-R-S, tigers, it's got five letters, check. So I also tried to now explain for those that really don't like, that are not scared about art, but it's like, what do I need to do to get an A kid? Or, you know, I'm not good at art. How am I going to pass art? So I try to show them, like, this is an easy way to, for you guys to check yourself. It has five things, T-I-G-E-R-S. You need to have three things on it besides the fact it says tigers that show me it's a tiger. Well, this one has tiger stripes, has tiger ears, has tiger eyes. And they tried to make, I mean, I know this because I know the student. They tried to make the body of the tiger here and the tail over here. And obviously you got the eyes on here. And then we discuss how the eyes draw your interest because they are the only thing that are white on the whole sculpture. I'm also a big fan of what not to do. <clears throat> so we have a discussion about what this says. And so for the interactivity portion of today's online discussion, can anybody tell me what this word is? Feel free to unmute yourself. No idea. Dragon. 
<laughs> okay, Allison is close. She's got the A-N. There is a G in it. So this actually says Morgan, M-O-R-G-A-N. So this is Morgan. Um, and I use this as an example to be like, it's one, it's hard to tell what the word is. But why is it hard to tell what the word is? You know, did they do it badly? Did they do it wrong? Well, no, but it's hard to see them because they painted everything one color. They splattered every single thing. Like nothing stands out. And you really can't, we try to discuss what this student was trying to show about themselves. I mean, it literally is splattered with holes in it. So if you can imagine in high school, what splattered with holes comes across with is like, well, you know, did Morgan get in a fight? Did, you know, did Morgan get shot? Like, what is she trying to, to say? Or what is this student trying to say? And so we kind of have a discussion of what not to do. Um, and then <clears throat> this is a part I'm gonna show here in a second. So I'm gonna skip this, but this is where I kind of shoot to the videos about filling up the blocks, because this is what my final thing's gonna look like. So when you guys see my demo, this is this. Here's another interesting thing about if any of you teach virtually, there are a whole bunch of graf free graffiti makers online that will actually allow you to do this. So students can mock up their words in Google Draw or on one of the free online graffiti generators, insert pictures and do all of this stuff on, on Google Draw. So they can do this on their own. And then they can actually put their paper over the screen and trace it for the step of putting it onto the clay. So this is also really great if you don't have the ability to draw or you have to like literally do everything on the computer is there are so many online makers, including Google Draw, that you can literally put all this stuff together on the computer. And especially I do have to teach like high end and special needs students. So if I have a student that really can't draw the letters I really encourage them to pull up Google Draw and, and or the graffiti generators and start putting them together that way. So either way is fine for me because this is a sculpture class. That's kind of what I need them to do. So we're gonna leave that one for a second. <clears throat> so, so far we are just on the planning stage. I'll kind of give like a minute here really quick. Does anyone have any questions about anything for planning? Yes, Steph. Would you be able to share this document with us by any chance? Yes, actually, if you go back to this, I'll share it with you guys, but if you go, oh, hold on, if you go. Or is it in your block? If you go, oh, for the love, come on, you can do it. If you go back to 3D Foundations, but I will put it in the thing we're doing today. There's the planning sheet right there. Oh, perfect. Thank so, you. Yeah, it's all in there. The PowerPoint that I just showed you and the, the yeah, so it's all in there. Yeah. All right. Anybody, anybody else on the whole planning stage? The whole planning stage for me, so I give the talk one day, come in the class the next day, remind the students of what they're supposed to kind of do, and then um there's a hold on steph can you see the chat by any chance if someone's asking a question and not um or if they're just saying hi judith just, just posted your link and uh carmel said thanks okay All right so some of you guys could oh. not sorry you don't need to hear me talk so these are the videos that are online um, if you guys want to see them on my YouTube channel, and it goes through kind of everything I've taught you. So this is me essentially telling the students kind of how that I'd like for them to plan. So I point out that I would like the five characters. And if they're not putting stuff in Google Classroom, um, oop, let me go back a little bit. If they're not putting things in Google Classroom and tracing, um, this is how I wanted to start. So I remind them that they need five characters. I tell them they don't have to, but if they wanna make it easier when they're carving out their sculptures, the letters should overlap. Overlapping does make the letters easier to carve. And I tell them that they do have to fill the entire box, no matter what they do. So when they draw, they have to fill up the entire box. Now, again, I don't ever stop students from not doing this, but I explain that this is the easier safe method and I tell everyone in the first box to literally print their name 
Like, don't even worry about graffiti. Just print your name and try to print it as big as you humanly can to fill the box. Again, I think this is a good way for my students to just feel safe. That way they just print it. They feel comfortable writing whatever word it is or numbers, and they don't have to worry about drawing anything. Then I tell them to either, if they're comfortable with it, do it, or to just look up again some of the things online because I want them to, I do want them to try to practice this a little bit. And so then I tell them to just do a simple block one. So just practice doing the simple block letters. Again, this is more of a like exercise of, because a lot of these students haven't drawn before. I explained that if the letters are thick, if you saw me pointing my finger there, you know, I'll do it again. If the letters are thick, it makes it easier to do because um, a lot of students like to hear that, that it is a little bit easier to make the letters a little bit thicker. So, and then the students go through and literally try to print that. I was talking to Steph before you guys got on. A lot of the students really enjoy like kind of hand holding step by step. So we kind of all do this in class together, right? The word, block out the word. Then I tell them to like look up their style. And now here's where they start like trying to get their style going on. They got the arrow style or the wild style or whatever the case may be and really try to do something funky. And if you can't do something funky or you really feel uncomfortable with your styles, open up Google Draw and trace your words as you kind of overlap them. Um, so this is where they're kind of trying to get their finalized one down. And the reason why I do this in the last couple boxes is I, if, if for when any of you guys try this, you will be amazed. And no matter how many times you tell a student to do something, and I know we've all experienced this, they will not do it. <laughs> so I'll be like, fill the box, make it bigger than your finger. Try to overlap your words. You have it on the board in big, like red, you know, dry erase marker. You've said it like five times now. It's on their paper. And what do I get? I get this little itty bitty drawing that's like the center of the box. It's like, okay, nope. You gotta like draw it larger down at the bottom in the center. The other thing I'd encourage is if they can't draw it or they're really struggling is to just write, like write what they wanna do. I want to put a basketball here. This should look like a lightning bolt. I hope to put a unicorn on this, whatever. And that's what I talk about here in this last little statement is like, if you can't do it, like if you can't draw the basketball, draw the best basketball you possibly can, draw an arrow to it and write the word basketball. So since mine is in a drawing class, I really just want them to learn about planning. That's the biggest thing for me. So they do these drawings, they plan it out, they get one that they really, really, really like. Then let's get this one going. And nope, that is not the right one. Let's get this one going. Is it? Nope, that is. Nope, there it is. Yes. So there you see that I've got my drawing transferred onto the piece, or, or I've got my drawing on the paper. If you have students at home, they can do it directly. That's air dry clay right there. They can do it directly on the air dry clay. Now I'm gonna skip this video, but I have a video I don't think we all need to watch, but it's over here and it's how to make sure your clay is four inches by eight inches. We're just gonna skip that one for today. Uh, but I do have a video that shows the students how to take like a piece of pipe or a rolling pin or something at home and how to measure out a four by eight piece of clay. If they're in class, they've already got this. Um, and so this is the next step. So four by eight piece of clay and you've got, oh, come on, you can do it. You've got your drawing. So if they have their drawing at home, they can lay their drawing directly onto the clay. And that's kind of what I'm explaining here. Like just put it directly onto the clay. Or at school, I hand them a piece of tracing paper. And I tell them to just trace the outside. We don't really need the details right now. We literally just want the outline of all the different letters. So no of that yellow, none of that funky stuff. I don't really need all the little details in my monster. I just need what my letters are going to look like. And I'll skip ahead here so you go, oops, 
just get way ahead. So you guys don't need to watch me draw over and over again. Um, but there, like just basic, simple letters, no details at the moment. Then you would either take the drawing or take the tracing paper, place it directly on to the clay. Um, and this part is pretty straightforward. People at home can use a pencil. Uh, I have needle tools at school or any other sharp tool, and they're literally just going to go through and poke through their paper and trace their drawing and transfer it from the paper right onto the clay. All right, so, I mean, that part is pretty simple. It's probably the most tedious for students, but I mean, it just involves literally going around and poking and poking and poking and poking and transferring it right onto the clay. All right. So, uh, skip to here. I'm not gonna make you guys watch this again. I won't make you do it. So after, so I think you guys can see the color difference. The air dry clay was very white. This is what my sculpture clay looks like. It's a little more gray. So after the uh, item is transferred onto the uh, clay. Uh, so tips and tricks for everyone out there. A couple things. If the kid has a word that's a little too big or bigger than four by eight, take the rolling pin and you can roll it out. Um, if you have nothing to roll out clay, if you didn't know this, you could take clay and if you hold it straight down and you slam it down, it will actually spread itself out. But it'll only spread itself out on one side. So you have to flip it over and slam it down on the other side and then both sides would be equal. So if you absolutely have nothing to flatten your clay out with, you can drop it and it will spread and then flip it over and drop it on the other side. Try, I talked about this at the beginning for those that just came in, these blocks, I, my clay comes in a big block and I can cut all my clay super fast into four by eight inch square rectangles that are one and a half inches thick. Um, so that's about how big my clay is because we're gonna do the subtractive method of carving these things. Um, so, and again, I use like a white sculpture, 06 clay that's fired. So um, we, oh, yep, yeah, Steph. Is one and a half inches the minimum it, thickness it should be so that it doesn't collapse? When sure. it's question <laughs> the reason, yeah the reason i find one and a half inch useful for me because by the time my students carve like part way in and carve part way in the thickest part of their sculpture ends up being like an inch which is probably the most you'd ever want your clay to be and like the thinnest spots are like a quarter which is like borderline sometimes breaking for beginning kids so that one and a half for me provides like a, a happy medium if that makes sense so if oh, they're thinner gonna, if they're thinner yes they could break easier you're gonna take it i'm assuming let's say we do this with air dry clay it's gonna dry flat right and you're gonna or you're going to stand it up and connect it to a base. Yep. You don't want it to collapse if it's yeah. too thin. Correct. Right? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. This provides, you're right. This provides stability with some parts being about an inch thick and some parts being about a quarter inch thin. So it does provide stability for the students. And again, beginning sculpture class, you've got some kids. I've got one on my shelf right now that says chaos and I should have taken a picture of it, but the one that says chaos I mean, the student sculpted like the C into the head of like a dragon. The H is like looking like Frankenstein that's going to attack you. Like the O is like a devil with its horns coming. So like I've got various levels. And then the S is a snake that wraps itself around the entire body of like the whole rest of it. So, I mean, like I said, this is kind of a generalization. Sometimes the kids will just go, but Steph, you're right. The, the inch allows for thickness for it to stand. Okay. Um, so we have uh, fettling knives at school. Um, but if you, again, for people at home, I was just saying like, 
take a butter knife, you know, like, you know, please don't use your parents good steak knives. But you know, if you have a sharp utensil <laughs> that can cut, and I'm not gonna, I, I feel I made this video and I don't want to remake it again. I'm not going to play it for you guys. But on here, I say the word like birthday cake like 50,000 times. And the kids always laugh at me when I show it to them or they watch it. Because I talk about how you should cut the clay straight down in triangles. So it removes easily like a birthday cake. And then I'm like, and I feel very much like I'm a cooking channel while I'm doing this. Because I'm like, and here's a birthday cake. And then I would say like, and then you come over here. And you cut another piece of birthday cake. And then another piece of birthday cake. I And the kids now start laughing because they've heard me say birthday cake on this video like three times. And you guys are all sitting here. And you can imagine as you see these little triangles being cut, uh, how many times I've used the word birthday cake so far. Because now I've also just used it six times while I'm talking to you about it. So it's really easy. Cut right up to the dots straight down is the most important part that I'm telling them like cut straight down and here I give some funny joke about not the birthday cake not wanting to come out um but straight down is super important and then I go through and high speed this video and I'm going to stop here in a second and talk about another tip that I share with the students as soon as I am done slicing all the little pieces of birthday cake out of this again. So I'm going to freeze this. So if you notice in here that I did not have them cut out anything in the middle, and I tell them about this, I say, I just want you to cut out the exterior, just the exterior right now. And I will probably say it 50 times. I will play this video. I will even stop the video and I will zoom in. And I say, see in here in the G, don't cut it out. In the N, don't cut it out. U, nope, don't cut it out. Don't cut out the Y. Think about this as you're cutting around the outside, almost like the crust on a piece of bread. Cut around the outside. I probably could come up with one more birthday cake analogy. So if anyone wants to help me with that. But cut around the outside of this. Don't cut the inside. And this is going to have to do with stability because right now your clay is green and very soft. And no matter how many times I say this, I will walk over to a student and the interior of this G will be cut out and everything else in it. When the clay is in this wet stage, it makes this clay very hard to remain stable, like Steph was talking about. It becomes very flimsy and we don't want that. So as much as you can, try to encourage them to just cut out the exterior. And with the air dry clay, it's the same way. The more mass we can have in the center, the better the next subtractive parts of the sculpture work. So try not to have them cut out the inside of the pieces as much as humanly possible. All right, so that is the front. So on. Uh, okay, so the front's all done. All right, the front is all done. And now I talk about that they have either in my classroom, um, they either can leave it in our cabinets for one night. Our cabinets have a weird magical power where if you leave the things in the cabinet for one night, they get leather hard. They don't dry out too much. One night they get leather hard, which is kind of nice. Or we used to have hair dryers, but then tip for everyone here and shameless plug, if any of you happen to watch my Art of Education YouTube series of teacher hacks coming out here someday um, that you can actually put a box fan on the top of like the sh industrial shelving, like the wire shelving that you buy at wherever. Like, you know what? Uh, hopefully, if you guys know what I'm talking about, like the wire shelving, like you get at Walmart or Target or anywhere. If you put a box fan on the top and a box fan on the bottom and you set it to low, and just kind of have like a constant air blowing through it, it'll air dry the clay like within five minutes, or sorry, it'll, it'll leather harden the clay like within five minutes, and it is 1,000 times less annoying than air dryers. Because I used to just have hair dryers for the kids to leather harden the clay, and I just have four hair dryers blowing circuits, and I couldn't talk over anything, and it was insane. And obviously, I can only have four students leather hardening their clay at a time. So I went to a clay workshop at a clay place in Cincinnati. Actually, Gail was there. 
So they have these wire shelves with these box fans and you could just put, I mean, you could put 30 projects on the shelves and the air flowing through it from both directions, leather hardens the clay. So I made one in my room. So now no more annoying hair dryers and the kids can leather harden their clay. So for this stage right here, just FYI, the clay needs to be leather hardened. So I talk with the kids about how, oh, yep, Steph. Sorry, I keep interrupting. Oh, no, that's what we're here for. When you put the project on the rack to dry, what are you putting it on so that it doesn't get the ridges from the rack shelves, but the air is still going through? So far, I have... They've either kept them on because I have the, I don't, I mean, what's funny is I'm pointing at my screen right now and none of you could see it. So if you can see, <laughs> I, I have them on canvas boards. They're little, they're boards that have just canvas wrapped around them. So they're either on the canvas boards or so far with these sculptures, since they're a little thicker, they haven't accepted, they don't really get the ridges. I really, it really hasn't been a problem, I guess. They're not heavy enough to cause a ridge and they're thick enough to not be sunk through a ridge. Okay. So I've been lucky, but they'll either keep them on a board because they'll forget to take them off or they sit them how they're supposed to on the ridges and they're good. Um, so then, um, well, oh, catching up. So we obviously have these uh, little hollowing tools and I was lucky enough during the pandemic to get some monies and I ended up buying a bunch. And so I did send home every kid a, if you can see to the right, I sent them home, not the knife, but I sent them home like a little kind of metal sculpting tool. I sent them home the riveting or hollowing tool. And then I sent them home a little wooden tool. So each kid got those three tools. Uh, that you're looking at. They didn't get a knife, just FYI. Um, and then I talk about how the first thing they're going to do is not carve all the way through, but they're going to carve about a quarter to a half of the way through. And in this lovely presentation, which I'm not going to let you listen to, I use the word ice cream about 20 times because I say ice cream scoop, scoop it out like ice cream, you know, like you're scooping ice cream. So again, you can imagine I'm saying ice cream now about 20 times as I'm going through here. So again, you'll try to say this over and over. Please do not go all the way through. We want to start creating depth. We want to go about a quarter to halfway through. And we just want to make the letters start to become 3D. We want them to start popping out just on one side, just on the front side. That's all we need right now is we want to get rid of all the little dots and we want the letters to start appear to be 3D. So the first thing we're going to do is take our hollowing tool and we're going to carve any place that we think may be a hole later. It's not going to be a hole right now, but it may be a hole later. And there we go. So I point out that I have now hollowed out all this stuff. It's not all the way through. It's about a quarter halfway down. Try to make them all even and make them look nice. I'm gonna scoot ahead here a little bit. Then I talk a little bit about using the wooden tool wherever letters meet. And now we need the letters to have a little bit of shape. We, again, we don't want the dots. We don't want to cut through our letters. We want the letters to have you know shape and kind of some letters to appear go behind. Some letters need to appear to come up. It's, you know, kind of like, it, it, I mean, it's a subtractive method of sculpting. It's like if you were doing a 2D piece and trying to create layers, you're just thinking about the front of your letters. I tell them to smooth out all the little, you know, dots to get the wooden tool to get out any imperfections and to try to smooth out anything that their hollowing tool may have left when they were scooping out their ice cream. So uh, that was in there. And then I go through here and this is when I learned how to use the speed up feature in my Wii video. By the way, shameless plug for Wii video, one of the best video editors, the easiest ones I've ever learned to use in my entire life. So luckily our district got a subscription to it. Wii video, amazing, just FYI. So I've now pointed out to them that I want them to hollow it out. I want them to like 
kind of make the letters start to appear 3D, make sure all their little dots are gone. Don't worry about any of the details yet. I want to tell that it's a Y, a U, an N, a G, and that's an O, but my monster is going to appear here in a minute. So I tell them, don't worry about the details yet. I just want to make sure your letters are the best your letters can be on the front. Skipping ahead. So <clears throat> front's beautiful. So I'm like, this is great. And this is the funniest part for me, but all of you guys are teachers or have worked in education in some way, in some form. And this is when they like lose their mind because I'm like, clean up the front, make it look beautiful. Take a second, make sure you have everything right. Now I want you to like clean up the sides. I want you to clean up the top. I want you to make everything look good here. And I tell them like, look, I can hold my sculpture because it's leather hard. It's not flip flopping apart on me, but it's still soft enough where I can like put my fingerprint in it and still do some work on it. And apparently I must have said something a little bit extra. So let's skip ahead and hold on. Come on, you can do it. Oh, there we go. So I tell them to look at the tops and the sides, make sure that all looks nice. Then I want them to flip it over. And here's where it is hilarious because it's almost like I have now started to speak a foreign language. As soon as you take a letter and turn it the other direction for students, they all of a sudden like go, what? Backwards G, that sounds a lot like chemistry. I don't know, it's so funny. They really get confused at this part, but all they have to do is take their tracing paper, retrace their letters. <laughs> Turn the letters upside down, like I'm showing here, and take their take your letters, flip it over, <laughs> and retrace your letters on the back the exact same way that you did the front. And still, it's some of them are like, oh, that makes sense. Some students literally look at me like, what did you just ask me to do? And I'm like, the back of a Y, the back of an O, the back of a U. What does the back of your sculpture look like? It, it is really... It, it's very interesting. Again, Steph and I were having a talk before you guys come on here about hand holding students through this. Process on the back is the same as the front. They scoop things out first. If they now want to go all the way through, they can because it is leather hard. They do not have to, but they can. And then they have to use the wooden sculpting tool to make the letters start to appear 3D. So <clears throat> it's really simple. It's the same thing. Flip the project over. Take your drawing, flip it over, take your tracing paper, flip it over, and then you got the whole back side of the letter. The back side's done. So I will tell you right now, there will be a lot of hand holding kids through this. That was my most thing that I asked when I was teaching online. What do you want me to do? How am I supposed to do this backward thing again? And in class, it's the same deal. Kids are like, I don't understand. Um, there are some fun exceptions, like some students will do like fire and ice. And they'll like, can I do fire on one side and ice on the other side? 100%. You're still carving letters. I don't care. Uh, one of my students, is a really cool one right now. It's not done. It's life and death. Uh, and she's got a bunch of other stuff on that. So one side's life, one side's death. A lot of students like to do their first and last name. Again, as long as they're carving stuff out and starting to make things look 3D, I am down uh, for whatever. So front's done, back's done. Everything looks beautiful. And so now I talk to them about uh, <clears throat> scoring and slipping. So at school, I have a giant bucket of slip. But at home, you guys notice off to the side here, uh, I've got a little bucket of water. I talk about like how to take some extra leftover clay that they have uh, from cutting out their sculpture and um, how to score and slip stuff together by making a paste uh, with the little bucket over here. So I'm pointing out now that I wanna make a monster. So I need to make a pencil, I need to make teeth and an eye and a spray paint can and stuff like that. So that's what I'm kind of saying right now, if you can appreciate that. So come on, you can do it. Matt, does the air dry clay work the same way? I have found that scoring and slipping air dry clay works just as good as long as the students do it right. Okay. Um, it's at least again, I can only speak for the stuff Columbus Clay gave me. Um, it seemed to work really, really well for my students to just take some water, mix it up like a peanut buttery paste and stick the things together. 
I also talk at home. I showed the hair dryer right there. Uh, if they don't have a place to sit their clay out, they can hair dry their clay. And so I say, if you're gonna sculpt something or do details, it is the same process as before. Start with your carving or hollowing out, subtracting, and then do the building or smoothing later. So I made my fingers and my pencil and my eyeball. And I wanna make some teeth and some other stuff. I started to carve a little more out here um, because it has a little more structure. And I'm gonna speed ahead for you guys a little bit. Um, Cause hopefully you all know how to do this, but this is a matter of sculpting, scoring, slipping. So I think you guys can all see that before. I don't need to uh, give the art teachers a review on scoring and slipping, but I talked to them about its importance. I shared them a funny story of a student that did the word candy and candy had all types of candy all over it. So it had little pieces of candy on every little piece of the clay and the student put the candy everywhere. And, you know, I have 30 students. I can't pay attention to what all the students are all the time. And the water tension, so the art teachers will appreciate this in the room. My kids, when I start talking science, fall asleep on me. But the water tension holds the clay together. Then when it's fired, if it's not scored and slipped, there is no mortar to hold the joints together. Therefore, when it's fired, all of the girls' candy just went and fell off the thing. So I'm like, if you don't do this part, your clay is just going to fall apart when it dries. Um, so we talk about the important, uh, the importance of scoring and slipping stuff. So um, I make the little hands and kind of do all this little jazz here. So I will skip that one. Then, So I've got all my little things made, my little tongue, my little teeth, my little hand, my little pencil, my little spray paint can. I got everything going on there. Um, they should have extra air dry clay left over. I, I'm not gonna lie, I stole my air dry clay video from the internet, um, but I have the students wrap up their extra clay in class in a damp paper towel and a couple plastic bags to use it as they use it. And the same thing, I, I had a really good video. This teacher explained it really well about using like cling wrap and like double cling wrapping it and like putting it in a bag so the light doesn't get to it. It was very well done and short. Keyword to that for at home students. Um, so I could see if I could share that. But it's, with their extra clay, I just talked to them about rolling out a base. Um, and this is kind of also when I explain like if they don't have, like what I told, told everyone here, if they don't have a roller, or something at home on which to actually do it. They can actually like throw it down. I talked about using pencils to measure for thickness, that it should be as thick as a pencil when you're making your base. Um, so all these lovely tips for the, uh, if you have students at home. Um, the pencil thickness is a good gauge for how big your base should be. At school, I am lucky. I have a very large slab roller. So the students go back there and they roll out their own slabs. So um, I teach ceramics as one of my classes. So I do have the benefit of having a lot of really cool tools. And the fact I've been there for 27 years and I just keep asking for new things. So also fun story to the art club out there. I got my first new kiln since the school had been opened. So this year I got, cause my principal was like, look, my guy can't fix my kiln anymore. And she's like, well, how old's the kiln? I'm like, how old's the school? She's <laughs> like, you're kidding me. I said, nope, no joke. She's like, the kilns lasted the whole entire, like, I'm like, yep. She's like, you need a new kiln. I was like, exactly. So my new one's got like a computer screen and an app. And I have no idea, it is amazing. Just FYI, if any of you are getting a new kiln, my old, put a cone in it and flip the switches. No more. I have an app. It's great. So uh, anyway, talk about using a ruler, talk about cutting it, cutting into any shape you want. Again, this could be part of your theme. Yeah, I have a quick question. Yeah. Sorry, I'm like working along and doing this. Okay. What do, what do your at-home kids use to poke? Um, Through I've, the paper? I've got my paper on my Okay. Tray. Yep. And you don't give them a needle. 
What did they use to poke through it? A sharpened pencil. A sharpened pencil. Okay, yes. and that works. Yeah, All right. I tell them a sharpened pencil, a toothpick was a very handy too. Okay. All right. Yeah. Not teach elementary, and I'm not giving 25 yeah. minutes no. out. No. <laughs> toothpick. Yeah, toothpicks are good, and pencils are also pencils okay. are really good. A lot of my students in class will use their pencils too. Yeah, they they won't even bother to reach in the box. They'll just grab the pencil because they see me do it on the thing. Um, and then we're scoring and slipping the uh, the base to the piece. So again, I won't kind of bore you guys with this one, but you get the idea. I explained to them one more time how to mix up the slip, and then I tried to kind of stick everything together and show them my thing to the camera and this was about impossible to do um other fun shameless plug for if you're making videos so i use we video our school has a subscription if our school did not have a subscription to we video i would pay for we video so that's how much i love we video it is by far and i teach computer graphics and know all the adobe suite products and i would still choose we video just fyi and I can teach After Effects. WeVideo is by far the simplest, easiest, and best thing to do. Also, shameless plug, I got it at any EA. IPVO, I-P-E-V-O, IPVO uh, HD um, document camera. So mine's probably about, I would say it's maybe a foot, a foot and a half tall. It's got a bazillion modes on it. It follows my hands. I mean, you guys have been watching these videos. Like, it follows my hands. I could put it on the wheel, and it'll follow the hand motions and the speed of the wheel at HD. It's wow. the IPVO is like I think ours were like a hundred and eighty bucks. It was under two hundred dollars, and I still have it. It is great. I have made like all my videos. We have done drawing videos, anything with an IPVO and we video. There's no lag it's high enough and it captures everything like just right. It is actually really, really good. So I Pivo and we video just FYI. Um, I mean, I don't think I've made a video that wasn't using, I lied because we started making videos a long time ago. I haven't made a video in the last three years that wasn't we video and I Pivos. All right. I bought an I Pivo uh, document camera. I think it was like seven years ago. And I never used it until the, the pandemic. And I was teaching from home and had to make vid demonstration videos. So even though it's an older model, it's awesome. IPVO is a really great brand. And I've used it tons since the pandemic started. Yeah. And they have <clears throat> all of their stuff. And we're a Google school, but all their stuff works with Chrome. So you don't even have to download the software for their things. So you can use all kinds of stuff. Even if you don't have a Wii video, they've got their own content that you can get for free, which is also kind of cool. Uh, so now I talk about coloring. And so both of, so for at home students, um, I gave I them- I have a quick question about the yeah. uh, attaching the base thing. So yeah. your sculpture is um, leather hard, right. but your slab, you just rolled out if they're using real clay does that attach very well so yes and i skipped ahead and sorry if i left this out so they also leather hardened their base so their sculpture oh, okay. is leather okay. hard and their base is leather hard i was just doing that i said it on the video and since it wasn't playing my voice and i skipped over saying it okay i say i, I was like is there something i don't know because no, I, I didn't yeah. know those two could go together <laughs> Okay. Yeah, no, I totally, in the video, I'm like, now I'm not doing this right now because I'm trying to get this done to show you guys, yeah. but, you know, you should leather harden your clay. And in class, I tell them to put it on the rack, leather harden it, and then attach it. Okay. Um, at home, I had a bazillion different options for them. Uh, they could, hold on, come on, get to it. You can do it. Uh, they could go, I was talking about, they could go to Michael's or Joann's or whatever brand of store that you guys, Walmart, Target, and get some like acrylics. Work the best. Then I say, if you can find watercolors, that will work, but obviously they will be more transparent. If you can't afford to go get paint or anything else, 
I talked to them about just getting markers to doing their air dry clay. Remember, this is with the air dry clay. So this is at home students. I suggest going to buy this stuff. I say, okay, fine. You can't even find colored markers at home. Maybe you can use Sharpies, colored pencils, crayons. I was kind of searching for everything. Air dry clay will take about everything. And I actually did get about everything turned in. I did get two really cool Sharpie ones turned in that were pretty black and white, but with some cool patterns. I did have one student that couldn't afford every, anything and literally colored it in with pencil. Wasn't bad, worked. Um, we were kind of going for everything. And with that student, I just kind of talked about the idea of like contrast. So leave some things white, try to press your pencil harder to make some things dark. Um, but at home, we were kind of like searching for everything. Our school district wasn't telling students they had to go buy something. So I was like, whatever you have at home. So I kind of went through everything uh, under the sun to uh, have it done. So I'm gonna pause this for a second. I'm gonna talk a little bit more as I show you guys some of these. So add, see if we can make this bigger. There we go, I'll zoom in so you guys can see it. So at school, <clears throat> this would be kind of an example of one. At school, we have, a, we have acrylics and this is the scary thing for me. A lot of you will appreciate it. Our students really haven't had to mix colors or learn much about colors because they have so little art. A lot of the student teachers, which I don't blame them, have a lot of what I call, I call them cookie cutter projects. It's like, this is the project. This is the project, this is how you do it. And, you know, they gotta get it done. I don't blame them. They have, my elementary teachers have 14 days. Like, what are you gonna get done in 14 days if you aren't telling the kids like really what to do? And the same thing with the middle school teachers, you know, they've got like nine weeks with the kid. It's the same deal. If you're talking about choice and you're trying to teach them all of these other things, you're not going to get a lot done. It's not until they get to me where they actually get to sit down and learn something. So this is my intro. I have, <clears throat> I put it in front of the room and they have black at one end and it's red, blue, yellow, and then white at the other end. And we have a whole lesson about color mixing, mix darker into lighter. And this is how you properly use a palette and brushes and what color makes another color. And I, the kids really find it refreshing because some of them are like, okay, young, we know yellow and blue make green, but then it's like, how do we make brown? What? What do you mean like red and green make brown? Think Christmas, red and green make brown, just like Christmas tree. Um, but this is kind of their first intro to mixing colors. Um, and they actually kind of find it really refreshing to learn about mixing colors. So let me, I thought I had these on here. Where's the other one? You know? I thought I had them up. Okay, we'll to do it. Yeah. Oh, there we go. I knew I had them up there. Uh, here's another one. This one says outside. So they got the little tree. Um, <clears throat> so a couple little fun extra things to do with their sculptures if you have the ability to do it. So with me, I allow them to do uh, a couple different things. If they want to do anything to their sculpture that isn't acrylic paint, they can get extra credit. So this is how we kind of push ourselves on the sculpture. So they can bring in spray paint because we have a spray booth. If they want to bring in like sand, like I had a student do beach and she put Mod Podge down all over her sculpture and then poured sand on it and then put some more Mod Podge on it. So she actually had sand. I had student do coffee and make a mug and then actually put coffee beans pouring out of the mug. So I encourage the students to bring in their own stuff and think outside the box. There was a student, there's one that a student did at home and took a picture of it. I thought that was kind of cool on air dry clay. A little more advanced student, obviously went to the store and got acrylics, uh, but that was an air dry clay one at home. You can even see the texture of whatever they used to roll out the, the slab there with, which is kind of cool. Um, but for at school students, I really tried to encourage them to do this. Now there's another fun presentation. If you want to watch it on my website called, this is not a 3d printing lesson. Um, <clears throat> and it's about how I use 3d printers in my classroom. So I spend a little bit of time teaching my students how to use Tinkercad. Um, and that is an online 3d 
kind of maker and how to find things on Thingiverse, which is another free site where you can uh, do this. So if you want to go take a look over at my 3D printing thing, you can. Why am I talking about 3D printing? Uh, because, let's get out of this again, go back up to here, scoot over here really quick, go back to my examples, foundations of 3D, graffiti sculptures. Okay, so these little things right here, these little lacrosse sticks. Um, <clears throat> if students really struggle, and I do have a lot of special needs students, or I have students that really struggle to make things for one reason or another, whether it's hands, disability, or whatever it is, I allow students to use, as long as they're sculpting, to like 3D print things too. So I had a student that really, I was struggling to get him to work, and, but he wanted to do Venom, but he wasn't going to do Venom if he couldn't get a Venom head. So we found a Venom head on Thingiverse. We printed out the Venom head for him. And as soon as I stuck the Venom head by his sculpture, he was all on fire to like make the words Venom. The student right here was really struggling to make like a lacrosse stick. So I printed it out for them. Um, so 3D printers can be really, really fun with this. I have a cool one again. I wish I would have taken a picture of it, but the student did Eeyore. And on Eeyore, they made the tail coming off the E and made the face a puddle. But no matter how many times she tried, she couldn't sculpt Eeyore. So she went on Thingiverse, found an Eeyore, reprinted out Eeyore, glued the Eeyore to the puddle, floating around on his back, and she painted up Eeyore, again, super happy student. So if you happen to have access to 3D printers and you want to try something fun with this, you can. If you don't happen to have 3D printers, you can offer up, like I do, extra credit to also bring other things in. Like I said, I've had one kid actually last semester, first time I've ever had this done, actually did um, racing as his word. And he made a track and then he, he like hot glued two hot wheels, like racing on his track. So thought that was pretty cool. Never had hot wheels glued to my sculpture before. But <clears throat> the kids really dig this because it's all personalized. Like everything's personalized. And I know they call it graffiti because it's lettering and it's style and it's artwork, but um, I, I think this is a really good way to do it. Last but not least, to leave some time for some questions, and this is on there too if you want to do this. Steph, did you have a thing before I show this? Well, Kathleen uh, just said that some of Matt's links in the teacher resources last night when she checked it out were blocked from opening. The worksheet opened, but some other links were not allowing permission. Okay. I will check. I will check those. I okay. promise. Um, so we do a lot of um, our school has a big literacy initiative. Our students really struggle to read and write, even in high school. Uh, so if I hear control plus again. <clears throat> so we have this big thing about any section with an X should be filled out, should be in complete sentences. This include capitalization, punctuation. We've gotten away from a lot of testing and we want the students to be able to write about their work. So we ask them like, what are the three things you did to visually help describe? What is your focal point? Why is it your focal point? What is the most successful? What did you struggle with? So we do follow up all of our projects with a self-reflection um, assignment. And it does go a little bit further down to ask some other questions. But again, it's like, what did you do with this and why? So we kind of go away from tests. This is also done in Google Classroom um, because we want the students to talk a lot about their work and use words like focal point, theme, mood, things like that. So with that being said, since we have like 10 minutes left and I have no idea where all my buttons are, so let's scoot this over here. Let's stop that for a second. We'll bring us all back in here, I think. All right. I guess now I will take any questions from the nine other people that are here. Anybody? I want to Is that okay? Uh, I want to confirm, when do you want to get the letters? Um, leather hard before you start doing any carving or do you yes. do some of the cutting? 
So you trace the letters. I've done that. Okay. Birthday cake out the exterior. Okay. Leather heart in it. There. Okay. Then then you do your hollowing and shaping. Got it. So there you go. Have you ever um, had students glaze these? No. <laughs> you can. Obviously, they're clay, so you 100% can. Um, so I do, I do a ceramics unit following this, and that's when we talk about glazing. Okay. So that's the only reason in my particular case. There's no reason why you couldn't. You could 1,000% glaze them. The only reason why I don't is a lot of mine this is like they're they really don't know anything about color and so i would rather have them experiment with eight dollar acrylics than eighteen dollar glaze <laughs> so Thanks. yeah it, it is it is uh like i said it is it is really interesting that my my students this semester are are very they are it is, I don't know, I, I can't really describe it to you. I think we'll all get this because we are, we are all having students that are all over the board. But it's like, I look at this student who's like one of my, he's a top athlete at our school, he's a basketball player. I would look at this kid and go like, I could, off the top of my head, I would go like, he's gonna make a basketball, Tigers, Nike, Kobe, he's gonna do something, right? What does he do? His whole project is about COVID and it's got a mask on it. It was like, like didn't see it coming. Like not in the slightest. I got a kid that was like suspended for the first two weeks, has all kinds of things on his rap sheet. <clears throat> and he comes in and again, you know, we try not to judge books by their cover, but like you look at his outfit, you look at his swag, you see that he's been suspended. You're, you're thinking like, this is going to be like, he's coming at me with some hard word or something else, or maybe the gang he's affiliated with something. And like, next thing I know, he's doing, um, what, did, what did he do? Because I thought at first it was going to be grass. And I think we all know where I was going with that one. But it ended up being like, oh, it was nature. That's what it was. It was nature. It was like really, really calming. And I was like, so my students are just like really, really kind of surprising me with some of the things they're giving me this year. It's like you see them and you just think like, this is what's going to happen. And then you see their word and what they're actually expressing. And it's like, this is kind of cool. Like it shows a little bit about the inside not really like the exterior shell so that's really cool because it relates to the whole social emotional thing where we have no idea what their internal world has been and now they're coming back into their school life and bringing their year and a half in isolation into their social space and that's what the biggest impact was for them is COVID or have, hanging out in a backyard or the woods behind where they live or, you know, this, these are things that we don't see. So it's bringing a whole new dimension to our understanding of our kids as well with what they produce. I just finished um, uh, qualifying base high school, you know, I, is that just Texas? Or is that all over? Base. Which one? Sorry. Base. B A S E. Visual arts. Scholar, uh, oh goodness, I don't know. Anyway, I think it's a Texas thing. Uh, but anyway, it's high school art competition thing all over oh. the state, and I finished qualifying it. I did it last year too. Um, you know, looking to make sure they did everything they were supposed to do. So many on this year were related to mental health. And COVID, I mean, like, it was deep. I mean, their art went really deep. I'll say um, I teach AP at my school, and so many kids want to focus their sustained investigations on their mental health and just 
a lot of insightful work being made, authentic work being made. And it, it is really amazing to see see what all these kids are doing. Um, I'm going to, I'm getting ready to have to hop off and go put the kids to bed, but Matt, I have a question real quick. This has been amazing, but um, have you ever done anything like this project with like the styrofoam blocks, the subtractive with the styrofoam carving or anything like that with this other than clay? Um, I have done it with plaster. Okay. So I've done it with plaster and that is the only thing else. Uh, I did one, and it's probably one of those like glitter things. Like I right. did one thing with glitter and I will never use glitter again ever in my entire yeah. life. Yeah. Um, but styrofoam, we did a thing for the play to build like, I think there were like, you know, stone statues or something. And then I was like, I will never use styrofoam again because it was everywhere on everything and it never came out of anything. So, um, okay. So I've done it, I've done it, I'm, again, I mean, the, if the process is the same, if you make a block and you can press into it and you could carve it out, I'm sure it's fine. Okay. Um, well, I, I was, from a material standpoint, from what I had on hand, cause I'm really, I'll just, at that, if, with that being said, I'll probably just wait until the supply comes in. Cause yeah. I can't stand, if it's anything like glitter, then yeah, okay. <laughs> Thank you, Matt, I really appreciate yeah. it. No yeah. problem, thanks for I coming. I wanna experiment with, um, paper pulp clay paper pulp clay that could be interesting as an yeah. option we use a lot of paper clay that was something else interesting also when i was doing my art hacks for the art of ed i talked about how i use paper clay and paper slip to fix broken or fired projects and the lady from the art of education had never heard of paper clay or paper slip and I, I don't know again maybe i'm well i am old but it's like one of those things that I just thought like everyone knew it. So did I'll you speak. buy it or make your own? No, I'm, I just make it. I mean, I just take my slip and take toilet paper and take some vinegar and whip it all up and keep a small batch on hand. You don't make it too much because it smells great right. after a while. But it does. It works on fire clay. It's actually really, really cool. So and Mary Green says that floral foam is great to carve. Mm -hmm. I would say, the, is that the green stuff? yeah okay. yeah it's a uh, um oh gosh oasis but the thing is is that it's very easy for the kids to carve they can do it with like a like a spoon it's real easy but what go. i would use it for is what i used it for it, it doesn't take a lot of jostling so what i use it for is i would give them i'd present them um pictures of different um sites that they were supposed to come up with some kind of a sculpture for like Operation Smile has a hospital and they have like a rounded driveway in the front. What kind of a sculpture would go in that rounded driveway? You know, that type of thing. And then they would take a picture and download it in front of their, it's, it, was a, it was like a couple of lessons combined, but download it in, in front of the building and colorize it. And that was it. So it was kind of an easy, you know, you could probably do that virtually as well, something similar to that. So there you have it. 100%. <laughs> also, also, if you if you take vermiculite, I think it's called vermiculite, and you mix it with um, plaster, it makes the plaster still durable, but easy enough to carve that they're not killing each other, getting angry with you. Vermiculite is um, very dangerous because it has... Um, um, asbestos in it they found oh, see, i was i've always well they're learning a new thing every day yeah so be careful We're, yeah i mean well obviously you've got to be very careful in general with the powder and everything it's very important but they stopped putting it in plant you know it used to be in like um um everything in every potting soil yeah yeah potting soil thank yeah. you right right well you know it goes for just about everything i think anymore oh boy Wow. So this was really, really informative. Thank you, Matt. Oh, no problem. I think I put the link to one of your YouTube videos in the chat earlier. So you guys could find your way around to the other videos that Matt was referencing from that one as well. And um, thank you guys for coming. Um, sorry about my voice again. Um, been a challenging week for me, but I look forward to um, seeing any of you who are going to be at uh, 
an AEA conference next month. And I'll probably have one more of these sessions in February um, before the conference. And if anybody wants to volunteer another session, I'll be very grateful. Thank you again, Matt. You are uh, wonderful and a huge supporter of this group and a great resource to everybody who, who joins us. So I appreciate Thanks. you. This, just like teaching art. <laughs> That's why most of us do it. It's just like That's it. right. That's yeah. right. I can just All set right. fire to things every day. So anyway. Yes. All right. Thanks, everybody. Right. Have a great evening yep. and a Stay good and rest stay safe out Thank there. Thank you, Jeff, for doing this all the time. Yes. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank Thanks. you. Bye. Thank you.